Domino's people delivered to the kids. Um, and uh, they were driving up just as I. Yeah, yeah, they, we, we got pizza and we got cupcakes and I got games and Aaron and Kara are back there and Ethan and they're going to have a good time. And so uh, we hope and uh, we're glad you're here and we're looking forward to this. Next week will be our prayer and praise service and we want everybody to come back. I came at, well, I, because during the summer I had turned the preset off because normally it, 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 it starts early in the morning and cools it down because we're working with one air conditioner and I forgot this morning so at lunch on my on my lunch break I came over and turned it on but it ain't working real good you got a nice breeze blowing huh well it's good to see you in God's house and we're glad you're here and we're excited about what God is doing and so uh, we're going to start with our prayer requests and I have a couple that I need to bring to you um, we need to pray for Susan is in the uh, she, she was in the emergency room about an hour and a half ago with a, she's in AFib and so they tried to give her some medicine it wasn't, didn't seem to be working Susan Carter and uh, so she's at Texas Health they're supposed to let me know if she's admitted or if they send her home they said if the medicine doesn't work they may have to shock her so um that's why, that's why I told Brian, I said, I believe Robin and maybe Aaron both have been there. <laughs> Not yet. Al's been there, too. Not yet. And uh, so, and you know Brian, he was talking about a cattle prod and something else. I'm like, no, nah, I, I don't think that'll work. <laughs> so we need to remember Susan. We need to remember Linda. Uh, she came through her, her surgery. She, she's still in ICU? Yes, she's still in ICU. Okay. And uh, she's at... Uh, UT Southwest over Dallas so we need to remember her Al we need to remember him he's not in the hospital last I heard he's not in the hospital um, but he is adjusting to having oxygen on so we need to remember him in your prayers um, I'm forgetting somebody I can't remember Augie we need to remember Augie he's in the hospital he cannot breathe and we need to lift him up in prayer. Uh, is, are there any other prayer requests that you might have? Yeah. Yeah. I asked this one lady right here on this. For some reason, the insurance company has decided that they know more than my doctor. They said for nine months, next set of injections, this one had killed the nerves and then the pain. So I'm praying that they somehow are able to get this thing worked out. Okay. Aaron? Yeah, I have a cousin that has a, about a one-year-old daughter, and she was born with dwarfism. And they went in a couple weeks ago to perform a surgery to widen the blood flow to her brain, and it caused her to have a stroke. And she's in ICU and in desperate need of prayer. What's her first name? Blythe. 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 Javon? He's, he's, he used to come here with you, didn't he, Some. He used to, and he kind of, ever since my brother brought him out of prison for 30 years, he was, uh, I don't know if he's going back to the point, but he was 40, and I think he was in the main room, I mean, like, I've been going on, and it felt so bad, and that when I tried to get to him, my mom was screaming, she's not, and I guess he doesn't let it, in her eyes, because I can't get to him because of the walls, but I've been like that. Right. 
Somebody needs to. We, we can pray for the Lord to soften him, soften his heart. We'll, so we're going to pray for Elijah. Any other prayer requests? Yes. Saturday, so we take the homeless things out. Um, and then we also pray for our protection, that God would open doors for us to share him and be able to pray for people. Okay. Anyone else? I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And we're going to pray over these needs. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, God, for your goodness and your mercy, Lord, for your loving kindness. Lord, your tender mercies are new day by day, Lord. And we just, we exalt you and we bless you and we praise you today in Jesus' name. We pray over these needs and these requests. Lord, we pray for Susan, Lord, as she's in the hospital with aphid. We pray for Linda, God, as she's recovering from surgery. Lord, we pray for the miraculous for both these ladies, Father, in the name of Jesus. We pray for Al, God, that you would touch him, Lord, as he struggles with breathing. And we pray for Augie, Lord. They don't know what's causing him not to be able to breathe. But, Lord, we pray for him that you would clear up whatever's taking place. We pray for Sister Lisa, Lord, in these injections. We pray that the insurance company would... Lord, that you would make a way where there seems no way in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for this baby, uh, Blythe, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord God, that you would touch this child and you would heal this child. And Lord God, we just lift her up to you, Father. Lord, we pray for Elijah, God, that you would touch his heart and soften his heart to the things and the ways of you. Lord, and that you would convict him of his wrong and his need for you and to change his direction father in the name of jesus lord we pray for our outreach team god we call out to you that we can be your hands and feet lord to those who are in need in in distributing this stuff god lord in the name of jesus christ lord we pray for our church and for our families lord and for their direction lord that we would walk according to your purpose and your will In the name of Jesus Christ, we give you glory and honor and praise in his name. Amen. 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 Brother Jose, would you wait on them with the tithe and offering, if you would? And uh, while he's doing that, I'm going to ask you, I know you just sat down, but I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to make our declaration. We we haven't been here in in several uh, Wednesday nights, but we make it on Wednesday nights. And she's putting it on the screen. Are you ready? Amen. I declare that through the power of the Holy Spirit in me, that I am empowered to live like Jesus, to walk according to His Word, and to be a witness of Jesus Christ to all the world. Lord, we thank You and we praise You in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. Brother Jose, if you just uh, walk around and give him an opportunity to worship you and or worship the Lord in giving (laughs) almost said worship him Um, and uh, if you have your Bibles I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Romans we had when we when we uh, stopped Wednesday nights we were around Romans chapter 7 I preached a couple of weeks on a Sunday on chapter 8 so I'm going to move to chapter 9 so this is the Romans road and we're going to be talking about um, Romans chapter 9, starting at verse 1. We're going to read through the verse first uh, uh, 14. No, excuse me. We're just going to read. I'll, I'll stop when we need to. Um, Romans chapter 1, verse 1, said, Paul's writing again in, in this letter. We're picking up in, in the middle of the letter. He says, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. That I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers 
from and from excuse me of whom are the fathers and from whom according to the flesh Christ came who is over all the eternally blessed God amen but it is not that the word of God was has taken no effect for they are not all Israel who are of Israel nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham but in Isaac your seed shall be called that is, those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand not of works but of him who calls and it, it was said to her the older shall serve the younger as it is written Jacob I have loved but Esau I have hated I'm going to stop there and we're going to pray and then we'll get into this we'll probably read um, some more as we go but um, Lord we love you and we praise you and we thank you for your word Lord for your truth we pray that you would open our, our eyes and our ears and our heart Lord, that we may hear and that we may see and that we may understand and perceive what you are speaking to us. Father God, we pray in the name of Jesus that the seed of your word would take root in our heart and produce fruit that would glorify and honor you in all that we say and all that we do. We give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. 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 And when you get to this po point in Romans, um, you can almost hear or feel uh, the sorrow that Paul has because uh, he makes the statement, you know, I, I, would, I would really sacrifice it all if my people, and he's talking about Israel, the Jews, would follow Christ. But as a nation, they had rejected following Jesus. You know, uh, there, there's people who, there have been people down through the ages who have used Christianity to, to attack the Jews and Israel. Um, I, I wasn't raised that way. My understanding is that God loves Israel even today. You know, uh, there, I've talked, actually talked to people who were Christian. I'm going to use that terminology, Christian, who did not, did not like Israel, did not like the Jews, and said that it was the Jews that crucified Jesus. The truth is the Romans crucified Jesus. The Jews submitted him him to the Romans, but it was the Romans who killed him. Now, I'm not giving the Jews an, an off. They rejected the Messiah. What we need to understand from that is even if you're part of the promise, you need to be careful because you can miss it. The Bible tells us the Old Testament was written for our understanding and for our, so that we can see how that, that Israel over and over and over separated themselves from God through their actions and through the things that they did. Now, Paul is writing because when Jesus came in his ministry, he clearly states that he is there first for Israel and then for the world, but first to the house of Israel. That's who he came to minister to first. They were and are God's promised people. And we should bless them. We should pray for them. We should understand. But what Paul writes here is, look, I would sacrifice myself for my fellow countrymen, but I have an understanding, this is what Paul says, that not all of Israel is Israel. Some of Israel are people that aren't Israel. You understand what I'm saying? They weren't born Israel or Jewish or that, but they became a part of the family because, and he talks about the birth of the promise. He talks about how that, uh, you know, uh, Sarah and Rebecca were both barren. They couldn't have children, and God gave them children uh, through a supernatural act. Through a supernatural act. You see, Abraham's wife, Sarah, she couldn't have a child. God visited Abraham and Sarah in the desert right before uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and, and Abraham fed them some food. Sarah pre had prepared it and, and uh, fed them some food. And, 
and then Abraham's 100 or 99 and Sarah's 89 or 90 and they look at Abraham and said you're going to have a son this time next year you're going to have the promise and Sarah in the tent laughed and God said why would you laugh she said I didn't laugh yes you did because you can't hide stuff from God even when you think you're in the tent okay and so it was it was a supernatural birth because they were beyond their years because we have an understanding that my birth into the kingdom of God was supernatural. It, it wasn't of my works. Just like the birth of Isaac was supernatural. Because Paul said it wasn't of works. It, it was because God said you're going to have a child and this is the promise. Rebecca, Isaac's wife, was barren. Couldn't have a baby. And when she and God blessed her. He said, listen, you're not just going to have one, you're going to have two. And it's not going to be the normal birth because the older one is going to serve the younger one. And we know that that was Jacob and Esau. And the Bible tells us that Jacob was the son of promise and that Esau was the son of the flesh. And we can see it in their personalities. We can see that you know Esau was a man who was hungry and sold his birthright for a bowl of beans. Now, I don't know about you. I've been hungry in my life, but I don't know that I've ever been hungry enough to sell my blessing for a bowl of beans. Yet, we make choices and decisions all the time because we're talking about the Romans' road to salvation. We make choices with our life that are relatable to, to the choice that Esau made. You see, are you giving away your blessing for something to satisfy you right now? Are you giving away the blessing? And, and no one can take it from you. You have to relinquish it. I know I've been guilty of that. Giving away the blessing of God, of, of Christ, that he has given me this gift to be satisfied for the moment. That's short-sighted. It's also very carnal and fleshly. And we see something that, that Paul writes that... that was written in the word that God said that sounds really harsh. It says, he says, uh, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, it, it wasn't that God hated, literally hated Esau, but God cannot abide the flesh. You understand what that, what that means? We have to come to God in faith, which is a spiritual act. You can't, you can't know God or come to God unless you have faith that he is. And that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But it takes faith, which is a spiritual act. It's believing in something that you can't see. It's believing in something that, that others may look at and say, that don't make any sense. That, that, that's ridiculous. But the truth is, it's a supernatural thing. Just like the birth of Isaac, just like the birth of Jacob and Esau, it's something that God gives to us because it's the gift. We don't work for it. We don't earn it. We're never good enough. We get it by His grace. Everybody say the word grace. grace. Everybody say grace. That's right. Okay, so I, I'm going to make this statement. Not everybody that comes to church is a Christian. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of people that call themselves Christians that aren't really Christians. I'm not judging them. I'm simply telling you the truth of the matter is just because you come in and sit and listen and go through the motions, that doesn't make you a believer. Gina and I had this conversation. She, she, was, she shared this with me today, and I've got it written in my notes. And she didn't know that I was going to be preaching about it. Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. It's the parable of the king who was having a wedding for, I think, his son. And he sent out invitations and the people that, if you read Matthew, it's pretty severe because the people that he invited, they didn't want to come. And the Bible says he went out to destroy them in Matthew. And so then he looked at his servants after that. He said, all right, I want you to just go gather anybody that you can find. Just bring them in, anybody that you can find. And they came in. The house wasn't full, but there was a lot of people in there. And as the king came into the wedding, he saw someone who was there. Gina had noted that. He called him friend. 
He said, how did you get in? Because you're not dressed the right way. I'm, and I'm paraphrasing. You need to read Matthew 22, 1 through 14. But he said, he said, friend, what are you doing here? How did you get in and you're not dressed? Now, I can relate to this on a different level because I work at the school and everybody has to have a tag. Everyone that comes in has to show some kind of identification. If you're a parent and you're coming to pick up your kids, you got to put, if you don't have a driver's license, we're not letting you in the door. For safety and security, obviously, to, in today's society, that, that's, that's required. And if, if you get in the door and you walk around to my office, which is the attendant's office, and you don't have your red sticky tag, I'm going to get out of my seat and escort you to the front and say, you got to get a tag. And I've had to do this a couple of times since I started working there last year. Not in an ugly way, but just, I'm sorry, where's your tag? They didn't give me one. I need you to come with me. Take them to the front. If they refuse to go with me, I'm calling the police on campus because that's, it's just one of the rules. But one of the things that blows my mind is the ladies at the, and I'm not criticizing anybody because it, it's hectic up there at the front, but the ladies at the front are not supposed to let any student in without their student ID on. Today, just today, there were six to ten students that stood by in front of my desk and, and, and I said, where's your ID? Oh, I didn't have it on. And the lady that works with me, has been working there for 24 years, she said, how did you get in? Well, they just let me in because they knew them. It doesn't matter that you know them. They're required to have the ID. According to the student handbook and the employee handbook, they've got to have the ID. And so we sent them. They want me to write them in, to sign them in. I'm saying, I can't sign you in without an ID. But you know who I am. I know who you are. I know your name. I know you're in the system. But without that identification tag, I can't sign you in. And I'm not putting my job on the line for you. So they get upset with me because they have to go buy a new ID because they've lost their ID. And that ID costs them $5 every time they buy one or costs mom and dad $5. This man was in the wedding and he was not dressed appropriately. You see, there's a lot of people who try to come to God in their own way, in their own fashion. And I'm going to tell you, that does not work. We have to come the way he requires us to come. So not every Christian is a Christian. The prerequisite for being a believer is to be born of the Spirit. It's a spiritual birth. Verses 7 through 13, talk about it. We've talked about it a little bit. This spiritual birth. Verse 14 says, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. We have to understand that God has called us to live. Now, I had someone ask me one time this question, and, and it, it, was, it was a believer, and it, it really kind of baffled me, the question. They said, is it going to be worse for someone who is a, knew, not as a believer, but who knew everything about God and doesn't make it than it, than it is for someone who didn't know and doesn't make it? And I'm like, neither one of them made it. I ain't worried about which one's worse. I'm worried about making it. You understand what I'm saying? I, I want to make it. I, I, and I can only make it by being born again. John chapter 3. Jesus talks about it. I want to read it. John 3 verses 3 through 8. Jesus said to him, Moses, he's talking to Nicodemus, Most assuredly, I say to you that unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. And Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verse 5, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it. You can't tell where it comes from, but it goes. 
So was everyone who, born, who was born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said, how can these things be in, verse, uh, in the next verse? And, and what he was saying is this. I was born physically of the flesh. I was born. I, I reside in this flesh. But, but the truth is, the real me was born of the Spirit when I met Jesus. When I confessed my sin and said, I want him to be Lord of my life. That's who I really am. And so I was born again. I was born of the flesh, but now I've been born of the Spirit. And I'm not the same person I was before I was born of the Spirit. And, and it doesn't mean I get it right all the time. But it means I'm pressing toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm, I'm striving to be like Jesus Christ. I desire to be like Jesus. Now, Paul is, in, in, in Romans chapter 9, he's kind of differentiating between the, the, the Jewish people and, the, and the, the believers who were coming, the Jewish people who rejected Christ. And so he uses the term Esau and Jacob. He talks about Esau and Jacob. And, and in truth, Esau was first born, but Jacob was the child of promise, who God was going to send his seed through. And I'm not saying that Israel was Esau. But they sure had some tendencies of Esau. Spiritually speaking, when Jesus came. And, you know, we the church, the body of Christ today, the Gentiles who are born into the kingdom have been adopted, all that good stuff. You know, we can think we're, we've arrived. We can think we, we were first born. We were not. We, the Bible says, Paul clearly tells us, you've been grafted in. Does it make me second rate? It just means that I need to be careful because if he'll cut off the promise, he'll cut off the grafted. Why are you talking about this? Why are you speaking about this? Because, our, listen, our nation is in a state. At one time, we were a Christian nation. Can't say that anymore. I don't, I don't believe we are. We, we, the church, need to be the church today now more than ever. We need, to, we need to stop being afraid to open our mouth and tell the world about Jesus. Not in, not with, not in a hateful manner, but, with, but in an anointed manner. That Jesus is coming. And you're going to miss it if you're not right. Jesus is coming. And you're not, gonna, you're not going to have a, a second chance if, it, if the rapture takes place and you're not ready. I know, I know that uh, people say, well, I'll give my life. Well, you, you should give your life now. You need to give your life now. You need to serve him now and not depend on your ability to sacrifice this physical flesh to die for Jesus. You should live for him. You see, he talked about the spiritual birth. We, we as children of God need to walk in... We need to walk according to the Spirit, endued with power. The Spirit of God is in me. The Holy Spirit lives within me. And He has empowered me to live like Jesus. To walk according to His Word. Now, it, sometimes, now, I don't know about you. I love the way Paul starts this chapter 9 and verse 1. He says, I'm, now I'm telling you the truth. I had a child one time, whenever he got in trouble, and he was trying to explain himself. He would say, now I'm telling the truth, Daddy. I'm, I'm telling the truth. And I'm like, well, your truth may not be enough. Yeah, so we, we, we tend to deal in our truth Paul was telling his truth doesn't make it wrong it just makes it his truth you know I'd be will, I'm willing to sacrifice myself if, if the nation of Israel would serve Christ but they rejected him and so we're, we we have to be mindful that God is just and if we reject him As a nation and as a people, judgment begins. 
I'm not a, I'm not a doom and gloom preacher. But I can recognize the signs of living in the last days. And our, if, we, if we don't change, our nation is headed for judgment. You can't mock God the way we've been mocking him as a society. I'm not talking about you and I per se. I'm talking about a na as a nation and a society. Our leaders. You can't mock God the way they're mocking him. And not expect judgment. Now I know, I know the church is praying. And I know saints like you. We're, we're crying out to God, and God always has a remnant, and he always hears his children. But there comes a point in time in this thing we're living where he's just going to pour out the wrath that he's got. He's just going to pour out his wrath. Now, the, 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 what we call the tribulation, that part of that wrath, I believe we're going to be gone. But that doesn't mean we're not going to face some difficulties. Uh, you're wondering why you came to Wednesday night service. I want to keep reading verse uh, 16 in chapter 9. So then, it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, and this is dealing with Israel coming out of Egypt, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and on whom, and whom he wills he hardens. And you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O man, who are you to apply, reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to take one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with, long, with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which, which he had prepared beforehand for glory? Even us whom he called, not only Jews, but also to the Gentiles. I want to stop right there. Because there's a lot of, this verse, this passage of scripture, in, in, and I purposely didn't skip over it. It would be easier for me to skip over it and go to chapter 10. Because chapter 10, 11, and 12, that gets into some really good stuff. And this is some really heavy stuff that gets meaty, and, and people get confused. Christians get confused. Denominations argue about this. Because there are some de denominations of the Calvinist, Cal Calvinism that would say, well, that speaks to the predestination of God. What that means, what they're saying is, you can be saved because God predestined it, but you can't be saved ever. You're going to die and go to hell because God determined it before you were ever born. That's not the God we serve. Okay, I don't believe that. I don't buy that. If you do, we can disagree to, we can agree to disagree, but I don't believe that way. Here's what I read this to me. Okay, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He wasn't going to release them. So God continued to do that. I, I, I look at this and what I see is what, what the Bible calls being turned over to a reprobate mind. Okay? Because we know. We know from Adam to Noah that man left alone by his devices, his own devices as a whole, without law, without grace, without direction, he's going to go downhill fast. It wasn't that many generations from Adam to Noah when God said, I repent of making man. They have gotten so wicked. The heart of man is eternally wicked. And so God understands because, and, and Paul alludes to it, because he's the potter. He created us. He made us and fashioned us. And his purpose for, was for us to have relationship with him and him to have relationship with us. But left to our own devices, we're not going to seek out a relationship with God. We're going to, I mean, all you have to do is look at the, all the other religions, all the other idols that are worshipped by man. I mean, it, 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 it's, uh, the Romans had so many that they had one dedicated to the unknown God because they were afraid they were going to miss somebody because they thought there were hundreds of gods that were worshipped. 
You can look in the Hindu faith. They have so many gods there. You know, they just, they're searching for the right one, so they just get them all. It's kind of a shotgun faith. We know there's one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. And we have to understand that. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to the Father except by me. Okay? And so when Paul is writing this, he's not, I don't believe he's saying, my interpretation of this is, he's not saying you're chosen and you're not. He's not saying, and, and in Matthew chapter 22, at the end of that, he said, many are called, but few are chosen. Meaning this, this is how, I, again, how I interpret that. Everyone's called to the feast. He called the, the, the promised ones. He called the ones who weren't promised. He called everyone. But you have, the, you have the ability to choose to put on the robes of righteousness of Jesus Christ. You should put them on every morning. I'm clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ because I know I'm going to fail today in my own self, in my own strength. But in you, in your strength, I'm clothed in the righteousness so your grace is extended and covers me when I'm short. Covers me when I'm short. So when he's, when he's saying this, uh, and he's talking about Pharaoh and talking about the potter and vessels of honor and dishonor, You can read a lot of stuff into that, but, but what I believe and what I would, would teach you and instruct you is that everyone has opportunity to come to know Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so we all have the opportunity. And we all get to choose. And that choice is whether I'm going to serve him. And, and I want to tell you something. I, I'm, I made my confession of faith in an altar many years ago. But I have to revisit that. Sometimes daily. So, sometimes minute by minute. <laughs> you know, because, but, because, because we're faced with... And I'm not saying if, if you mess up, you're going to hell. Or, or you're immediately a sinner. That's not what I'm saying. But, but we have to submit ourselves on an ongoing basis to Jesus Christ and to, to, the, to, to the will of God and to his purpose. We have to willfully say, you know, our definition of what it means to backslide is to willfully turn away from serving God. Say, I don't want him anymore. I'm not going to live for him anymore. I'm not going to serve him anymore. It, 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 it's not that difficult to understand. You know, if I'm, if I'm living for Jesus and I, I, I fall, I fail. If I get back up and keep going and ask forgiveness, he's going to forgive me because the Bible says he will. And I get up and I brush myself off and I, I, I plead the blood of Jesus over my life and I keep going. But if I lay there or if when I get up, I turn and go back to where I came from. Have you ever been on, on, a, on a trip or a, a, a drive or, or a hike or something and the way just got too difficult? You said, I'm just going to go back the way I came. It's easier that way. You're turning back. You're saying, I'm not going to press forward because the way is too hard. And, and that is what we would call backsliding. Willfully turning away. And Paul you know, he's, he's dealing with something that, that it's difficult to understand. But we have to take into consideration the character of God. Do you really know the character of God? Growing up, listen to some of those old-timey preachers, and I'm not throwing stones at them or talking about them. I thought every time I made a mistake, I was going to hell. Every little thing I did, God was up there blotting my name out, and I was a sinner one more time. And there was a point in my life where just about every Sunday I was getting saved. But that's, I've come to understand that's not the way God is. And I'm not lost every time I make a mistake or, or commit a sin or stumble and fall. When I, I'm still his child, I, I understand as a father, when my children do wrong, I may be upset with them, but I'm not disowning them. I'm not kicking them out. I'm not, I'm not stopping my love for them. Now, as, as they've gotten older, if they choose to not be 
If they don't want relationship with me, if they break it off, I, I'm okay, I, there's nothing I can do about that. That's their choice. But you better bet I'm going to be seeking them out every chance I get to repair that relationship. Why? Because they're my children. How much more, how much more does God love us? Oh, man. It, 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 you can't even conceive how much more he loves us. And so you have to understand the character of God. And Paul is talking to an audience uh, who they're dealing with. Has God rejected his, Israel? Are we better than Israel for the, for the Gentiles? Are we better than Israel? No, you're not. Israel saying, well, we're Israel. Just because you're Israel doesn't mean you're better than the Gentiles. You've got to understand that we're walking this thing out together in faith through Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to verse 25, and he's quoting from Hosea. He says, I will call them my people who were not my people. Now he's speaking of Gentiles this time. Right here. And her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, that they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. Because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of, uh, of Sabbath had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom, Sodom, and we would have been made like Gomorrah. Verse 30, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith. But as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone as it is written. Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling rock, stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Now, I want to stop there. Well, that's the end of the chapter, but I want, I want to say this. What Paul is really dealing with with the church at Rome is their faith. Because apparently some of the believers in Rome had been, they, they were Jews who converted to Christianity, but they, and, and listen, we face this today. We face it, we face it, we face it. We face discrimination. We face discrimination because of race. We face discrimination because of social economic levels. We face discrimination. And, and it goes both ways, friend. There's discrimina discrimination against African Americans. And there's African Americans that discriminate against, against white people. There, there's Hispanics that are discriminated against by whites and blacks. And there are whites and blacks who are discriminated against by Hispanics. I'm so conflicted because I'm all of them. I've done my DNA and I've got African American, I've got Hispanic and Latino, I've got Native American, I've got some white in me, I've got, I've actually got a little Asian in me, I've got some from India. The only place that I couldn't find that I had in me was from Russia, that, in that area. But air, I, you look at the, my map and I've got colors all over. Gina looks at me and says, you're conflicted, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. I don't know whose side to take. It really is. Because our, our lineage means nothing. And that's what Paul was trying to say. He said, and they, were, they asked the question, they were asking this question, why did Israel miss it? He said, because their faith was in the law and not in Christ. And that's why the Gentiles were accepted, because their faith was in Jesus and not the works of the law. It doesn't make them better, it just... They, for whatever reason, the, the Gentiles that they were questioning and the Jews that, that they were questioning, they, they didn't get it. And, and it's imperative that the church understands that the, this that we are living and walking and breathing and, and supposed to be sharing, it is an act of faith. 
our faith to believe that he is who he said he was. And he doesn't differentiate between the color of your skin or the number in your bank account or where you grew up or what your past was. Because when he covers you with his blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, you look the same as every other believer. You don't look any different. He don't see black. He don't see white. He doesn't see brown. He doesn't see yellow. He doesn't see big money or poverty. What he sees is his child. And until we get that, we're going to be divided. But if we can ever get that, no one can stop us. No one. At winning people to the cross of Jesus Christ. I've never wanted to be a pastor of a white church. Or a black church. Or a Hispanic church. I just want to be a pastor of Jesus' church. And I think that looks like what I used to sing as a child. In kids church. And Sunday school. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world red and yellow black and white they are precious in his sight Jesus loves the little children of the world but you know we don't just discriminate we don't just discriminate against people of different colors we dis we discriminate against people of different financial backgrounds I grew up poor my mama would fight you in a heartbeat she'd get on to me for saying we were poor because her definition of poor is if you didn't have holes in your underwear you weren't poor we were poor she made sure we had as kids growing up we didn't have holes in our drawers but we had holes in our shoes and in our socks and in our pants I guess she's worried we we're going to get in a wreck and have to have clean underwear on I don't know but we were poor. But we, we didn't know that. But I want to tell you something. I have, no, I have no trouble talking to people who don't have no money. Because I grew up that way. It, it's a little bit more of a stretch talking to someone who has a lot of money. Like a doctor. Or a lawyer. Someone who has more education than me. You see, we, we get intimidated about what we don't know or what we don't have. But I want to tell you, whether you're rich or poor, you need Jesus. The attorney who has television spots on the TV and advertisements needs Jesus just as much as someone who lives in the hood. God doesn't love one more than the other. He loves us all equally and the same. Your background doesn't matter to him. What you've done doesn't matter to him. What matters to him is will you follow him? Will you follow him? Paul, he's trying to get them to understand. In verse 30, he says, what shall we say then? And I'm wrapping it up. The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, they've gained it or they've attained it. Even the righteousness of faith. But Israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained the law of righteousness. Why? Because Israel didn't seek it by faith. And they stumbled. Listen, they could not understand. I will give you an example. I was reading this morning my devotion in Luke. And I, I've read through Matthew and Mark in just the last few weeks in, in Luke. I'm, I'm around verse, or chapter 10 of Luke. And I read a couple chapters every morning. And I was reading in Luke. I just lost my place. I had a senior moment. <laughs> Jesus giving Luke. Yeah, I know I'm in Luke, but I don't know what I'm talking about in Luke. <laughs> oh, I was just, I was so busy talking about reading Luke in the morning. Oh, 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 oh. I remember, I remember, I remember. Okay. I remember, I got it. Came back. Shh. May go away. The Jews struggled 
with what Jesus did because he was doing the work of the Father and it didn't match what they were seeing in the law because they were so bound and tied to the law. I, I was reading in, in one place this morning where, where you know, the, again, one of my favorite songs right now in praise and worship is I Just Want to Be in the Room. And it's a song about, you know, where they tore off the roof and lowered the, the guy who was on his bed. He couldn't walk. And they couldn't get him in through the doors or the windows because there was too many people. And so his friends tore off the roof and they lowered him down because they knew if they could get him in the room, his life would be changed. And when, the Bible says that when he was lowered down and Jesus looked at him and his friends dropping him down, I wonder what that scene looked like, that he marveled and he said, man, you got great faith. I don't know if he's talking to his friends or to, to the man, but he said, your faith is so great, your sins are forgiven. Wasn't necessarily what they were looking for, but it was a greater blessing than what they maybe were looking for because he said, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the scribes, the religious people who were sitting around watching him, the Bible says they thought within themselves. They didn't say it out loud. They thought within themselves, who is he to forgive sin? And Jesus, having the spirit of discernment, said to them, why do you question me whether I have the authority to forgive sin? So that you'll know who I am, I'm going to say to you, get up. To that point, he was still laying on the bed. Take up your bed and walk. And the Bible says immediately he got up, he rolled up his bed and went rejoicing to his house. They didn't understand. Another portion I read this morning was where he went to the synagogue to teach, as was his custom. And he sat down and, and he was fixing to teach. And they thought within themselves, again, he, they didn't say it, but they thought, or they talked among themselves. They didn't ask him whether he believed in keeping the law of the Sabbath. And there was a man there, the Bible says, who had a withered hand. And he looked at him and he says, is it right or wrong to do good on the Sabbath? And they didn't say nothing. So he looked at the person and said, stretch out your hand. And when he did, it was immediately healed. And it made them angry. The Bible says they sought occasion against Jesus. Because they could not conceive that this new thing was about faith and not the law. It was about believing and not keeping. You hear me? They were used to keeping the law. Keep the law. We've got to do it right. We've got to keep the law. We've got to match what the law says to how we're acting. We've got to stand in line. And anybody that gets out of line is going to hell. And Jesus comes along and says, i got a new line. And this line follows me in faith. Believing that I am who I say I am. And if he walked this way, they walked that way. And if he walked this way, they walked that way. But they were following in relationship the Messiah. And that's what God wants all along. Is us to walk in faith. In relationship. With him. I ask you to stand. Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you tonight. Lord, we thank you for this day. And God, we thank you for all you've done and you're doing for us. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. I thank you, God, for salvation. I thank you, Father, for who you are and what you've done. I thank you, Lord, for these who are here I thank you, God, that you open our heart, our spirit to hear and to receive. I pray, God, that we would receive the seed of your word and it would be implanted in our spirit and produce fruit. And that you would be glorified and that you would multiply that fruit, that seed. Some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold, God. But everyone produces it. God, I thank you and I praise you and I worship you. In the precious, wonderful name of Jesus Christ. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Amen.
bless you. Thank you for being here. Be here Sunday, 9.30 for the walk, 10.30 for morning worship. Also next Wednesday is our prayer and praise service. You don't want to miss it. We're going to be praying for the sick. Um, if you know someone who is sick, I want you to invite them to come. Not only that, I want you to fast either the day before or the day of at least one meal. Fast something to see God move. Will you, will you do that with me? Sure. I will commit to fasting on either Tuesday or Wednesday for our, our Wednesday night prayer meeting because I believe God's still a God of miracles. He's still a God of the supernatural. God bless you and go with God. Have a blessed week. Yes.